can register either at uh, the Welcome Centers or online. 2024 graduate honor service, Sunday, May the 5th. In our morning worship service, we will be honoring our POA students who are graduating high school and college. To participate in our graduate honor service, you must register online no later than April the 26th. So share that with your family. This Sunday, April the 21st, 9 a.m. Sunday school, 10 a.m. worship service. Looking forward to Pastor Andrew delivering the word. Amen. All righty. I want to dive into what uh, the lesson I feel the Lord has given me for this evening. And I want to talk to us tonight about complete obedience. Complete obedience. Um, Lex and I are in the throes of raising two toddlers. One is almost a toddler. He'll be two in June. Uh, Isabel will be four in October. They are both, though, however, at the point in their life where they think they know what's best and they sort of do their own thing when they want to or how they want to, where they want to. We are doing our best to teach both of them that obeying mom and dad are in their best interests. Not only are we looking out for them and want what's best for them, but it's in their best interest because we may have to pull the belt out. I know that's not popular anymore. I better not say that. The authorities are probably on their way as we speak. I have not used a belt yet, by the way. While there are days where we have challenges, for sure, they're, they're, they're kids, they're toddlers. For the most part, we have two good kids. They do a good job of listening and obeying Isabel's going to try you a little bit more than Gad will, uh, but we've got good kids. The more their faith in mom and dad grows, that we do have their best interests at heart, that at this stage in life, we do know what's best for them. The more they see that, the more they believe that, the more their faith will grow in us. And when their faith grows in us and when they see that we care about them, that we care about their well-being and that we probably really do know what's best for them, at least I hear until they're teenagers, the easier it is for them to obey. It takes faith to obey. In fact, God encourages us to put our faith in him so that we will obey. Hebrews 11 and 6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. In other words, if you will believe in me, if you will obey me, and in believing and obeying, that will cause you to want to seek then I've got a reward for you. That scripture is telling us that we have to have faith to be pleasing unto God. And I would expound a little further and say we are pleasing God when we are obeying him and his word. We are putting our faith into a spirit called God that we have never seen. Many of us, I know this isn't the case for all, but many, and I would say most of us, have never heard him audibly speak. All we can point to is our personal experiences and this word of God that has stood the test of time to even prove his existence. So to take the word of God and to be obedient to the word of God and to let it rule and reign supreme in our life that begins at the very foundation of faith. We are called to be obedient. And that takes faith. 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrificing, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? 
Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Above all, God desires that we obey him, that we obey his word. And when he speaks, we better listen. We better hearken. That is greater than sacrifice. In fact, in Hebrews 12, 26, he says, I want you to hear my voice and obey so bad that sometimes I'll even have to shake some things up around you to make sure you know who it is that's talking. Verse 26 of chapter 12 of Hebrews, whose voice shook the earth. He'll do some shaking when he wants us to know he's talking and he wants us to perk up our ears. God desires that we obey his voice, that we obey his commandments, that we obey his word, that we obey the path and the plan that he has set before us. And this leads me tonight to a man in which we can glean from in his complete faith and trust in God and his obedience in that trust. Hebrews 11, the faith, the hall of faith chapter and verse seven. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. We see Noah's story begin to play out in Genesis chapter 6. Now I know that we are living in some kind of day that is uh, not hidden from us. The wickedness that is going on in this world, the wickedness that is taking place in this country, it sickens me to see how wicked our society has become, how evil it has become. And if it sickens me, just a mortal human being who was born in sin and shaped in iniquity, whose righteousness is as filthy rags, but by the grace of God, if it sickens me, then what must God be feeling? You ever stop to ask that question? How terrible the world seems to us. What's going through God's mind right now? Right. Having said that, however, this isn't anything new to God. It's not like he hasn't seen this before. He's seen it bad like this before. No, it wasn't being on, posted on social media every single day, and no newsrooms weren't constantly keeping in, in front of people's faces, but the world has seen wickedness like this before. Genesis 6, 1 through 7, it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. That's the line that we know as the Nephilim. Verse 5, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only on evil continuously. All day, every day, all man thought of was bad stuff. That's pretty bad. That's not good. Great evil. Great wickedness. To the point where God says, it repented the Lord that he ever made man on the earth. It grieved him in his heart. Verse 7 the Lord said, I will destroy man who I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, the fowls of the air. For it repenteth me that I have made them. 
I can't fully explain everything that took place in verses one through four. Nobody has a complete explanation or understanding of those verses. But the consensus is that the sons of God described in those scriptures would be fallen angels who are not human beings as we are, but they are spiritual beings with the ability to possess. Now, I'm not going to get deep in the weeds on what Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is because I don't have all the answers, and that's not my sermon tonight, but I do need it for a precursor of where we are at the time. These are spiritual beings with the ability to possess, or the consensus is. An example would be the demoniac of Gadara, fallen angels, demonic possession. Remember when Jesus called Legion out of him, they immediately asked to go into something else, a swine of pigs, the swine. Because fallen angels, demons, have to have vessels to work through. Jesus speaks that one day in heaven we will not marry, that we will be like angels. So it doesn't appear that angels have gender. Though when they are referred to in scripture, it is always in masculine form. The possible best explanation for verses one through four is that of possession. That the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were fair and possessed men and took them as wives. I cannot prove that, but that is a likely scenario as likely as any. At the very least, it does appear that verses one through four is a glimpse of fallen angels infiltrating society and creating many different types of strongholds. Physical strongholds, mental strongholds, emotional strongholds, spiritual strongholds, keeping society of that day bound in sin and wickedness. The wickedness was great. The thoughts and imaginations were on evil continually. So bad that it grieved the Lord in his heart and he repented that he ever made man. So wicked that he wanted to destroy man. That has to be some kind of wicked for God to say, I want to destroy man that I have created from the face of the earth. It was so bad that animals had to pay the price too. Beasts, creeping things, fowls of the air, they've been polluted by man. I have to destroy them too. As evil as today's society is, evidently, it can get worse. And in the midst of that cultural and societal background stands one man. One man by the name of Noah. Verses 8, picking up in Genesis chapter 6. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. It's verse 9. A righteous and a blameless man. Not without sin. We know that he makes mistakes later in his life. But this man walked with God when nobody else would. He's essentially the odd man out. I'm sure the society around him called him crazy, called him weird, all because he refused to conform to the world. He refused to let the culture of his society dictate his life. His goal was not to please society. His goal was not to please those around him. His goal was not popularity. His goal was not being on Forbes billionaires list. His goal was not to miss church every other weekend for baseball and soccer tournaments because I want my kid to be a superstar. His goal 
was to please God. That was his goal. When you live in a world that is full of that kind of wickedness, that kind of evil, and you are the only one standing for what is right, now that's what I call pressure. Making a putt to win a golf tournament or a free throw to win a basketball game all of a sudden doesn't seem so significant in comparison to standing up for what is right when you're the only one doing it. And we all face that pressure on a daily basis in some form or fashion. At work, we are pressured to act or be a certain way to reach the top. When we see our friends around us and how they and their kids are living, we feel the pressure to keep up. We find ourselves daily under pressure to act a certain way, look a certain way, to have certain relationships if we want to be successful. We get squeezed by pressure daily because we're the odd man out when compared with society. It's easy to walk with God like Noah here in church tonight because we're all surrounded by others who are trying to do the same thing. We're all surrounded by a bunch of friendly crazies, if you will. We're in a safe environment. But once we leave here, we go back to work, we go back to our friends, we go back to maybe even some of our family members, we begin to feel that squeeze once again. It's not always easy when we decide to be a Noah in a postmodern society. Because the closer we get to God, the more we are going to stand out as non-conforming to what society says we have to be. And so there is coming a day in the not too distant future, soon and very soon, okay, you don't want to conform to our belief system, we're not going to hire you. You don't want to conform to our belief system, you're never going to climb our business ladder. You don't want your you, we, you don't want to conform and you don't want your kids to conform to our belief system, then they aren't welcome here at this school or they aren't welcome here in this program. You, church, don't want to conform to saying what we dictate you can or cannot say. You, church, don't want to conform to not saying what we deem as hateful when God just calls it sin. You don't want to conform, church? Okay. We'll just take away your 501c3 tax-exempt status if you don't want to conform to what society is teaching. If you don't think those days are coming, the groundwork is already being laid. Let me encourage you tonight. No matter the squeeze, no matter the pressure, Keep being a Noah in this postmodern world. Amen. Noah walked so closely with God that from the text that we are given, this holy writ, Noah is the only human being on earth that God is having conversations with. The very first scripture, scripture that we read about Noah tonight was Hebrews 11 and 7. It said, being warned of God. So the conversation went, hey Noah, since you and I are so close, since you and I have relationship one with another, and you are not distracted by this world, and you are not conforming to society, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I'm about to destroy the whole world, but it's all good. I've got a plan for you and your family. Could it be the reason that some of us, some of us aren't hearing the voice of God as clearly as we would like? Could it be that we aren't getting the warnings from God in our lives because we're just a little too close to this world system? Could it be that we've allowed the pressure of everyday life, could it be that we've allowed the squeeze of our society 
to cause us to conform little by little. God is calling us to do as Noah did. Walk with him. Because when we are walking with him, that puts us in close proximity with him. And if we're in close proximity with him, it's real easy to have a conversation. It's real easy to hear what thus saith the word of the Lord is. When you are close to God, when you are walking with God, then relationship becomes easy and communication becomes easy when we are in close proximity. That's all he's ever wanted to do is walk and talk. Go back to the very beginning. What did he want to do with Adam and Eve? Just wanted to walk and talk in the cool of the garden. That's all he's ever wanted to do. Just walk and have a little chat. I want to walk with the Lord. I want to talk with the Lord. Woe be unto me if I let this culture dictate what I am or am not hearing from God. Genesis 6, 11 through 14, it continues. The earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. God looked upon the earth. Behold, it was corrupt. All flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Verse 14. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. So God speaks to Noah. Hey, Noah, gives him his warning. I'm going to destroy everything, and you need to build a boat. Say what? Build a what? Build a boat? What for? That's what my question would have been. Put yourself in Noah's shoes. Back to Hebrews 11 and 7, the Bible says Noah prepared an ark being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Noah was asked to build an ark for something he's never seen. Something that's never even been heard of. Noah had never seen a flood. It's never rained one single drop of water on the earth at this point. Everything was watered from below. Just a side note for your consideration in your own time. The world, the atmosphere, the earth was very different pre-flood than post-flood. For starters, you're doing pretty good if you make it to 80 today. Back then, you were still young at 350. It's never rained a drop. There's never been a flood. God warns Noah about something he's never seen. He lives most probably in the area of Mesopotamia, somewhere between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, what would be northern Iraq, northern Syria, southern Turkey. So a boat this size needs an ocean. And he's at least a couple hundred miles from one of those. We have the benefit of hindsight, ladies and gentlemen. I get to look back on this story and say, duh. But Noah's point of view, you want me to build a what? What for? Why? That's what I would be asking. I like the way that I heard a preacher say it one time. I'm sure Noah was saying, my goodness, even if just briefly, he probably said, God is losing his mind. I like the way one preacher said it. If God speaks to you and it sounds weird, get ready. Because he's getting ready to do something big. The stranger the path feels that God is leading you down, the greater the destination is going to be in your life. Hey, Noah. I'm getting ready to destroy the whole world with a great flood using an instrument in the atmosphere called rain that you've never seen and you've never heard of. So I need you to build a boat on dry ground and I need you to trust me and I need you to obey me. To let you in on some measurements God is requiring, we are going to use today's terminology. The ark is approximately a football and a half 
field long, 150 yards long, approximately four stories high. That's higher than the building that we are in right now. God continues on where the window needs to be, what all needs to be brought on board, what all needs to be stored. Gives him all the specifics until we finally get to verse 22 of chapter 6. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And that's really what I want to drive home here this evening before we go home. Here is Noah, the only righteous man alive. Defiance of the cultural norms is what he is doing on a daily basis. Walking with God, talking with God, and then God has a very strange request out of left field somewhere. And he asks Noah, obey me, trust me. So many intricate details in this request. So much work has to be done. It's not going to be easy. Society's going to mock you the whole way through, Noah. It's going to take you 120 years to complete all of these menial tasks. Oh, and the Bible never mentions God ever talking to him again up until the flood. Never gets another direct word from God. No other conversation where God audibly speaks in this 120-year process. We've all been guilty of saying, I've waited and waited on the Lord. And he still ain't rained on me yet. Try telling that to Noah. 120 years waiting on something that nobody's ever even heard of. We've all been guilty of saying something like that. All of this that God has asked Noah, everything, the long wait, the intricate details, the difficult task of building a ship that big with just you and your family. And look how he responds. Thus did Noah according to some of the things God commanded him to do. Thus did Noah a few of the things God commanded him to do. Thus did Noah according to all God commanded him to do. We are all guilty of partially obeying God. Here we are tonight. We're all at midweek service. We're all doing our very best to have relationship with God. This in and of itself, us being here, proves that we are serious about our relationship with God. I've repented of my sins. I've been baptized in his name. I've been filled with the Holy Ghost. I've obeyed the word of God to the best of my abilities. And, and we should all celebrate that in our lives and we should all celebrate that in the lives of others. But we are also very good at obeying only portions of God's word. We aren't always the best at doing all according to what God commands us to do. Whether it's in which laws and statutes of his words that we can work within and then throwing out the rest that don't really fit our lifestyle because then that would hinder my status in society. Sometimes it may be a difficult request from the Lord. Maybe it's switching jobs. Maybe it's staying at the one that I see as less significant and not as monetarily beneficial. Maybe the Lord has placed a calling on my life and I'm only partially giving myself to that calling. Maybe I've only been dealt one small talent, but I'm hiding it instead of doubling it. Maybe it's just an odd, odd request that God makes and it absolutely makes no sense to me. And I think God is off his rocker a little bit. And I'm just going to do what I want to do. If Noah would not have fully obeyed God. If he would not have stayed consistent in those 120 dry years. Going off of just one warning and one directive from God. If he would not have stayed faithful and true to his beliefs. 
if he would not have continued to walk with God, if he would have begun to conform to society, if he would have begun to cave to the whispers that were being murmured about him, about how crazy he was, about what a lunatic he was, if he would have begun to cave to those things when he was building a boat waiting on something that nobody had ever heard of, then he would have wound up with a half-finished product that wouldn't even stay afloat. And his family and all the promises of God would have sunk with him. But because of his faith, because of his trust in God, because there was no request too big and there was no delay too long that would ever cause him to not wholeheartedly obey everything that God asked him to do. Because he did that, in doing so, he spared himself, he spared his family, and he spared all the creatures that God brought on board for him. Complete obedience. It's not easy in a postmodern world but that doesn't mean that it is still required. We don't have time to really dive into another story, and I'm coming to a close if you want to come to the music. But a similar request was made to the man of faith, the father of Israel. Genesis 22, 1 and 2, we know the story very, very well. It came to pass after these things that God did tempt. Abraham, put him through a process, put him through a trial, put him through a situation. We don't like to say it, but the fact of the matter is it's true that there are times where God causes some difficulty in our life. Abraham, here I am, take now thy son. Thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, get thee into the land of Moriah. Offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, Mount Zion, which I will tell thee of. The son that you waited a century for, the one that was going to carry on your legacy, I want him to be offered up as a burnt sacrifice. Talking about complete obedience. Without hesitation. Without a question of why. Without saying, well, let me pray about it or let me fleece God first to make sure that I heard him right. Without delay, Abraham obeyed the Lord. Verse 3, he rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, he claved the wood. He did some work. He got the wood ready for the burnt offering. Rose up. Could you imagine cutting the wood that was going to burn for your own son? He did it. Rose up, went unto the place of which God had told him then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass. I and the lad will go yonder and worship. For the tenny preached a great sermon, a place called yonder. I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Verse 5 is one of the most important verses in this whole story. Gentlemen, we are going to worship. But listen to where Abraham's faith kicks in. He said, we're coming back. We'll come again. I've got faith that God is in control of this outlandish request. If I have to offer up my son as a living sacrifice, that's no problem. God will just raise him from the dead. We're coming back. 
I have a promise from God that through Isaac would come the seed. That's Genesis 17, 19. God says, Sarah, thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. You'll call his name Isaac. I'm going to establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. Isaac ain't married yet. Isaac ain't got no kids yet. Abraham just kept on trusting, kept on obeying. No matter how far he had to go, he was just going to obey God. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac, his son, took the fire in his hand and a knife. They went up together. Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, my father, and he said, here am I, my son. Behold the fire of the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, my son, God, that I'm obeying step by step. I've obeyed everything up to this point. I've trusted him up to this point. God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they both of them went together. I'm out of answers, son. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know where the sacrifice is. But God will provide, and he's going to do it all by himself. I've gone as far as I can go. I've obeyed, I've listened, I've trusted to what he told me to do. I've chopped wood, I've brought the fire, I've brought you. I've gone as far as I can go. Amen. Now it's up to himself. And himself, that himself we're talking about, he's got the answer 100% of the time. God, Isaac, is gonna show up and do what only he can do. I've done all I can do. I've obeyed. Now it's up to God to do what only he can do. They came to the place which God had told him of. Abraham built an altar there, laid wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. The angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. Don't you touch the lad. Don't do any harm to him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that, that, how, that how you have withheld not thy son, thine only son from me. Now I know, Abraham. Now I know you truly fear me. Now I know what lengths you are willing to go to obey me. Let's all stand together. Abraham proved he would obey God no matter the request. And because he obeyed and trusted God, God could trust him. God trusted him enough to build a nation from which the Messiah would come. The craziest request from God birthed the greatest miracle ever known to mankind. Trust him and obey him. Even when it feels like you've been building a useless boat for 120 years. Hold on to the word of God in your life. Keep obeying. Keep trusting. No matter how hard or no matter how much pressure you may be feeling from the squeezing of the outside world, keep obeying. Don't give up now. Don't give in now. Even when it appears God is getting ready to take away your long-awaited promise, just keep trusting. Just keep believing. Just keep obeying and watch the miracle God will perform in you and what he will do in your life. Our society is coming at us hard. There's pressure around us every day to conform and give in and to put our trust elsewhere, to obey other things. All right. Amen. There is only one place where we can put our complete trust, and that is in Jesus Christ. And when he asks something of us, when he requires something of us, we better wholeheartedly obey 
what God has spoken to our lives. Can we get to heaven partially obeying? Sure. Sure, I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that you can't still make it to heaven if there's one little thing you missed here, there, or yonder. I'm, I'm nobody's judge. I don't determine heaven, hell for nobody. That's determined by the one who died for all of us. But I don't want to give it a chance. I don't want to partially miss out on something I'm supposed to be obeying God on. I want to wholeheartedly obey God. If God is speaking something into your life and it sounds crazy and you know it's coming from God, do what the Lord has told you to do. No matter what the request may be, no matter how difficult it may be, no matter how dry it may seem or how long it may have taken up to this point, just obey God and there will be a miracle performed in your life. It may spare your life. It may spare your family. It may birth a miracle. Just keep trusting. Keep obeying God. Before we leave here tonight, it's 8 o'clock. We're right on time. I'd ask you to throw your hands in the air and let's make a fresh commitment to God. Lord, whatever you're asking, whatever you're desiring, whatever you're wanting from me, Help me, God, to not just partially obey. Help me not to just pick and choose what fits me, what fits my schedule, what fits my personality. Help me to give everything unto you. Help me to wholeheartedly obey what you are seeking from me. I give everything to you tonight, Lord Jesus. I make a commitment fresh and new. I want to walk with you and I want to talk with you. I don't want to conform to this world system that maybe would mess up mine and yours conversation. I don't want to get so close to this world system that I can't clearly hear what you are speaking into my life. If I can't clearly hear what you're speaking, then I can't wholeheartedly obey what you want me to do. So help me to separate from this world, God. Push me away from this world. Any unclean thing that is within me, get it out of me, God. I want to be apart from this world. I am in, but I am not of. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renew our minds here tonight, God. Give us the mind of Christ tonight, God. Renew our minds. We don't want to be conformed to this world. We want to be transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Help me, Lord, to wholeheartedly obey you. Go after you with everything that is within me. Complete obedience. It's greater than sacrifice. It's what the Word says. Obey the Lord. Obey what He's speaking to you. Obey this word above all else. Don't obey the man in the pulpit. I'm a nobody. You obey this. You follow this. The these, the thou's, the thou shalt not. You follow this word wholeheartedly. And watch what God will do in your life. Watch the miracles that will be birthed. Watch what you will be spared from when we're wholeheartedly obedient to the Word of God. May God bless you. Looking forward to Sunday. Pastor Andrew's going to deliver the Word. It's going to be a great day. Invite someone to church. If you have never obeyed the Word of God, repenting of your sins, being baptized in the only saving name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, the name of Jesus. And if you've never obeyed receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, evidence and speaking in other tongues don't leave here tonight without it it is for you wholeheartedly obey this word of god may god bless you you have a great evening everybody